Okay, so let's uh, talk about food production. First, we're going to address monoculture. So monoculture is the way that most farming is done, um, especially in the United States. So what is monoculture? Monoculture is this, uh, basically when you grow a, a single crop over a very large area of land. That's the easiest way to think of it. So mono meaning one, culture sort of referring to uh, crops or growing, you know, cultivation. So here's an example of monoculture. This is a, um, a broccoli farm in California. This is actually organic. So, um, but you can see there's rows and rows and rows of broccoli as far as the eye can see. You can grow just about any crop with a monoculture technique. Uh, corn is really common, soybeans and so forth. So the, the key to monoculture, it's a single crop grown over a very um, large area. Whereas you something um, that you saw in the video uh, where Jeff Lawton was um, uh, demonstrating the difference between monoculture and what you call polyculture, um, but the 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 earth does not naturally or nature does not tend toward this type of arrangement. So if this were natural, you would have little weed species growing, you have little tree species, you have different plant species all over the place. So this is a more natural area. You have all these different plants in a small area. So that's the way nature normally does things. Humans intervene uh, and they tend to go toward monoculture. The question is, why do we go toward monoculture? Uh, basically, you know, it's all about profit, really. I mean, we can maximize our yield. So we can control the conditions really uh, specifically. Uh, we can industrialize the farming. Um, what uh, Jeff Lawton refers to it as a plant factory. It's often called um, factory farming or um, industrial agriculture. <clears throat> and um, so the key here really is that you can really control conditions. Um, you have these, you know, you can get these giant machines that can uh, do, you know, rapid harvesting and rapid planting and all that stuff. Basically, if you can afford the um, the investment, uh, you can, you know, it's a little, it's more profitable because the production is higher. So some of the problems with monoculture. Remember, nature does not nature does not tend toward monoculture. It tends more to be more polyculture. So what's some of the problems with monoculture? I mean, there's a lot of issues, you know, apropos to our lesson today, um, biodiversity obviously just by definition has gone down because there's less organisms in the, in the area relative to something like this. Um, so resilience is actually compromised. Um, if you think about um, what we talked about in the biodiversity lesson, remember more biodiversity means more resilience. And so if you're not biodiverse, that means you have less resilience. So something like this, the problem here is these are probably ge genetically identi identical. And so if you have a pest that can attack um, this species of broccoli, and if it can spread its way far, far enough, you can destroy the whole crop. Whereas if you have something like this, you know, you have a little uh, pest or fungus or whatever that attacks one of the flowers uh, or one of the plants, there are other plants that sort of back it up. So resilience is compromised. Uh, again, nature doesn't normally do this. So in order for things to grow this way, you have to have more chemical inputs, more fertilizers because the soil can't handle that yield, more pesticides, more herbicides, generally speaking. Now these happen to be organic. So uh, in this case, you know, you don't always have it, but the, the large scale industrial farming that is not organic, they're using more, uh, they end up using more um, pesticides and, and, fer and fertilizers and so forth. So um, a lot of the industrial uh, farming now, they have these specialized seeds, they're hybrid seeds that you can't propagate, that you can't basically, you know, a, a regular plant um, obviously naturally replenishes itself, it'll drop seeds and regrow itself, but the new seeds, they what they do is they, they make hybrid seeds or genetically modified seeds that don't, they don't actually, um, they're not viable, so you can't take seeds from a GMO tomato or a hybrid tomato and then save the seeds and plant it and grow another one, so you have to keep buying seeds, it's kind of the point. Um, Promoting centralization is an issue. Uh, overall, you know, if you have this um, uh, monoculture, you have more fossil fuels uh, through uh, the fertilizers that you're using, the pesticides and herbicides, and also just the, the machine-based farming. Um, it also destroys soil. One of the problems with non this is with non-organic monoculture anyway, and I would say the same for organic monoculture, um, but to a lesser degree, is that it, as you use fertilizers on the soil, it actually re reduces the soil's ability to replenish itself naturally. Um, and so it actually, you kind of need to use more fertilizers over time. So there's a lot of issues with um, bio, uh, monoculture. I mean, the big one here is since we're talking about biodiversity, but there's all kinds of other impacts. Now, there are some benefits to this, obviously, um, that we wouldn't be doing it if there's not benefits. I mean, you can produce more per acre. It's cheaper. I mean, it makes food cheaper. Now, if you think of cheaper in terms of the, the direct cost to you or the private cost, absolutely cheaper. I mean, modern agriculture, industrial agriculture is 
in some ways seen as a miracle uh, in that it's um, made food, uh, you know, much more available to people at a lower price um, than we ever thought possible. So it is much cheaper. Now, the problem is with all these other sort of drawbacks, um, at some point, it may not be cheaper because, you know, we're promoting these super bugs. We're, you know, it's becoming more expensive. We're losing our soil and so forth. So, but the really nice benefit to be very fair to monoculture and to industrial farming is that it does tend to make crops cheaper, at least if you're not looking at externalities like climate change and, and some other issues. It is very efficient. I mean, it's reliable. We, we can control the conditions very specifically, um, and it is very profitable. So there, there are definitely benefits to the monoculture. Um, I would say certainly in the short term. Uh, in the long term, it gets a little more sticky when you start thinking about it, externalities. Okay, so factory farming and concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. So this is basically when you have it's it's uh, when you have a lot of animals that you're growing in a uh, very small area of land. So you can see they're very crowded in here. Cows are not naturally going to congregate like this. Pigs are not naturally going to live in conditions this tight. So it's it's sort of like in a way it's monoculture for for raising animals. Um, but it's a little worse than that because you have a lot of problems with these. Um, and the soil and water quality is. You know, you just have these an unnaturally large amount of animals in a, in a small area. It's going to damage the soil. Um, the runoff can be really bad. We talked about dead zones that can actually happen when you have these huge mass of cattle or pigs or chickens. Um, the runoff uh, does cause eutrophication and does cause dead zones. Um, we tend to have a high reliance on chemicals, hormones, and antibiotics. One of the big problems is antibiotics. Um, they literally just feed antibiotics to um, livestock. Um, now they're starting to work on laws to change this, uh, but one of the problems with, if you can imagine, you know, you have all these animals in an unnaturally small area, um, they're, they're walking around in their own feces, I mean, they're, they're dirty all the time, um, they're just not meant to be in conditions that tight. So one of the big problems is that they're they can get sick pretty easily. You know, if one cow gets sick, then the other, you know the disease can um, pretty easily spread. And so that promotes the use of antibiotics. Um, another problem is if if it's hard to see, but this was in the video um, with cows, especially, um, but also pigs and chickens too. Um, they're feeding them corn. Okay, so the main diet of cows in the U.S. is corn. This is not natural. Cows are ruminants. They're um, they've evolved to eat grass. I mean, that's what they digest. So they can't really digest corn very well. Uh, and so one of the problems is this is that they um, it basically makes them sick um, for lack for you know kind of the simple way to put it and so you have all these cattle in a, in a, a small area and they're not eating their um, the foods that they're naturally evolved to eat and so they're basically sick a lot and so they end up just feeding a lot of antibiotics to them. Um, so one of the problems with this is the overuse of antibiotics. So believe it or not, of all of the antibiotics used in the United States, about 70 to 80% of them are used for livestock. So think about that, 70 to 80% of antibiotics by volume in the United States, not to treat sick people, not even necessarily to treat sick cows, although they do use it to treat sick cows and other animals, but it's just for animals. So this has become a real problem. Um, Antibiotic resistant bacteria is a big problem. And I don't know if you've heard of this, but you know they're having all kinds of issues with, you know, what used to be just normal infections. You just, you know, you go to the doctor, you have an infection, they give you, a, you know, a course of antibiotics, and it's done. Well, the problem is because they're giving so many antibiotics to livestock. The problem is if you if you feed that uh, so many antibiotics, you end up the the bacteria that do survive after these huge doses of antibiotics end up very sort of the, the strongest ones and then the only ones that do survive are tend to be resistant to the uh, the antibiotics that they're using and so then if you try to use those same antibiotics to cure you know kill them um, they can't because they've you know the only ones that actually survive after all of these antibiotic use are the ones that are in you know, sort of can't, don't respond to the antibiotics. So this is becoming a big problem, um, a really, really big problem. This is becoming a bigger issue, and that's one of the reasons why they're starting to, in the U.S. anyway, they're looking at legislation and try to reduce the use of antibiotics with livestock. Okay, so just to give you an idea of some of why we call this factory farming. Um, so here's a, um, 
farm in Brazil. Um, looks like a corn farm. So you notice, I mean, these things are massive. These uh, combines are huge. Uh, I mean, you know, this is industrial production. This is not, I mean, it's farming, but it's really just industrial scale farming. I mean, this is like a giant machine. Uh, this is a feedlot in Brazil. Uh, it's maybe hard to see, but you're, you can actually see these are all cows. Um, again, unnaturally, very unnaturally uh, close proximity. There's not even any grass around here. It's all dirt. I mean, you know, cows normally they graze on grass. So this is this is a, 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 an example of a CAFO. Um, this is an egg factory in Ohio. Not an egg factor, but an egg factory. Okay, so this is just these chickens uh, spend most of their lives, if not their whole lives, in this little pen, um, and they're just there to lay eggs. Um, this is an automatic feeding system in a hog barn in Canada. Uh, I'm not, to be honest, certain that they uh, get out of the cage, but I know they do have things called gestation crates, um, with, where uh, animals really can't um, get out of their cage or spend their whole life in a little cage, which obviously is um, not not something they would naturally do. So the animal welfare is a big issue. Now, whether or not that's sustainability related is kind of, uh, it's a little iffy, but uh, in terms of some of the other impacts, the water impacts, the energy impacts, the chemical impacts, and so forth, um, there certainly are uh, sustainability implications to uh, factory farming. Okay, so moving on to a new topic. Um, there was an article about bees. Now, this is more in the biodiversity side of things. Um, so there is something called colony collapse disorder. So bee colonies are dis disappearing worldwide. Uh, this started, you know, mainly uh, around, I think, 2003. And they started to discover that these bee colonies were collapsing. Um, now, bees, you know, they're annoying, right? Nobody likes bees. Well, one of the problems with bees disappearing is that bees pollinate about a third of the diet. So just from an anthropocentric perspective, bees are very important. You know, they, of course, they pollinate other plants as well, so they help other nature uh, kind of do its thing, um, but they're a very important part of what pollinates uh, a lot of the plants that we eat. So what's causing colony collapse disorder? Well, <clears throat> it's almost certainly a commonly used pesticide called neonicotinoids. Um, so this is first used in the U.S. in 2003. Um, so pesticide is uh, designed to kill bugs, and so um, they're finding that this neonic, what they call neonic, um, uh, likely affects the bee's central nervous system. They get confused and disoriented and so forth. Um, they're almost certain that this is what's causing it to the point that France, Italy, and Germany have banned it. Um, I think since this article was written that more have banned it in the European Union. Um, in the United States, uh, we do not take the precautionary principle. Uh, we tend to uh, allow chemicals to be produced and used uh, until we find out that they're dangerous. Um, there is, there's, of course, we're not going to produce, you know, straight up poison, you know, things that are going to kill people. But we tend to approve chemicals first, and then not until we figure out later whether or not they're good or bad, we might ban it. So why are we using neonicotinoids? Well, again, um, you can actually the EPA, who's in charge, or the U.S. Uh, the USDA sometimes they can actually approve the use of these chemicals before they're proven to be safe, which is, you know, I think pretty backwards if you if you think about it. Um, whereas in Europe they use the precautionary principle. So if you think about how the precautionary principle could be used to help this type of thing happening, in e the EU they tend to say, listen, well, you can't use that until you prove that it's safe. In the U.S., it's more like, okay, we're pretty sure it's safe, so you can go ahead and use it until we find out that it's not. There are many examples of chemicals that they thought were safe that they turned out are not, um, but that's just the way we do things in the U.S., probably a little bit backwards, but um, that's it's, – it's a kind of a hot-button button issue for um, a lot of people that are worried about this sort of thing. Okay, so we, we're pretty sure that these pesticides that we're using are killing bees, uh, which – uh, we're sort of, again, we're destroying our own ability uh, to survive uh, in some ways. Okay, so moving on uh, to a different aspect of sustainability in food. Um, uh, there was that article about uh, the slave trade in Florida. Uh, and it may sound ridiculous that I just uttered that phrase, slave trade in Florida, but it is true. Um, Imokele is a, uh, I think it's a county in Florida. 
and it's often referred to as the, the it is the tomato capital of the United States, okay? Um, but it's also ground zero for modern slavery. Um, not to get into too much detail here, but the, the gentleman that wrote the article that was posted, um, he did a whole, you know, he did some research on this, and he found there's this whole culture that um, uses slaves to grow tomatoes in Florida. And it's sort of the same old story. You know, you find some immigrants that aren't legal. Um, you promise them money to come and work on your farm, and then you bring them over. They are basically scared to do anything, to say anything to any authorities because they're not legal. And so what happens, if you recall from the article, is they end up, you know, they live on the farm. <clears throat> the farmer um, provides their housing, which in some cases was just basically a tractor trailer bed where they'd have, you know, 10, 12 people living in this bed. Um, there's some instances of they just, their bathroom was a bucket in the corner. I mean, it's just some really nasty stuff. And the problem, the reason that we call it slavery is because the uh, the farm would own all of these. And so the farmer, you know, they would pay them not a very good wage to pick all these tomatoes. And then they would charge them to do things like use the bathroom, use the shower, that, you know, food, whatever, to the point that they would charge them so much throughout the month that they effectively weren't making any money. They were just making enough to pay back the farm. And so this obviously is a very bad for, um, you know, equity, for, you know, social sustainability, not, not a good for the people at all. Um, incidentally, you may notice in this picture that these are very green. So these are going to be, you know, like hard as a rock, basically. So... Um, if you think about why would they pick, you know, such green tomatoes, uh, how do they end up, you know, being edible? Um, well, this is down in Florida, so there's a, you know, if you can ship these tomatoes over the course of a couple of days, by the time they reach their final destination, hopefully they'll be ripe. So tomatoes will ripe as you let them sit. So this is normally what a tomato, what an inorganic tomato that they're shipping over long distances uh, is going to look like. Um, so back to the slavery thing really quickly, quickly, since 1997, at the time of the writing of the article, there were over a thousand people freed from slavery in Florida, uh, in the, you know, about a 10 year span, 10 to 12 year span, over a thousand slaves were freed from Florida farms, uh, in the late 1990s and early 2000s. I mean, it's just amazing that, that that's a reality. Um, you know. The bottom line is, this is how tomatoes are grown. Um, if you've eaten a tomato in the winter in most parts of the U.S., there's a pretty good chance that it was grown by slaves. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell you how to eat or when to eat or what to eat, but it is, I think, important to understand the implications of what you're doing. And just, you know, just an FYI, I mean, the tomatoes in the U.S. are grown for size, shape, and color. So people, they buy a tomato based on how it looks. And so they're bred and they're grown to be a certain size, shape, and color to make them attractive. Okay, so that's the tomato slave trade, uh, basically. Now, there are uh, a lot of issues with slavery in the shrimp industry, and this is pretty recent, um, just a couple of years ago, and they've, they're finding that there are these shrimp boats um, in Southeast Asia that they basically trap the people there. Um, you know, they're, they... Uh, they take these, again, immigrants or illegal immigrants, they, they basically take them out of boat and trap them on the boat so they can't leave, or they'll take them back to the shrimp processing and they won't let them leave the building. But the bottom line is they're doing this. It's not even as sort of clever, if you will, as the Florida slave issue. They just straight up take people and don't pay them as opposed to saying, well, we're going to charge you for this, this, and this. So this is a really, really, really big problem. Um, to the point that I think uh, recently um, in the U.S. they ban the trade, of, uh, ban the purchase of um, uh, shrimp from I think it was Thailand, but I'm not sure, somewhere in Southeast Asia because slavery was so rampant. But you know, you know, it gives you some pretty cheap uh, shrimp cocktails, and that's why it's done. Obviously, it's cheaper to not pay people than to pay people. So it keeps the prices cheap. It keeps the prices competitive. Uh, that's really the bottom line. It's all about um, making money. All right, so the last little thing, and we've talked about irrigation in another lecture, but uh, I just wanted to reiterate that in terms of irrigation, this is your central privet irrigation, if you recall. 
So, you know, you have this big machine that moves around in a circle. Remember, about about 40%, you know, take that with a grain of salt, but about 40% of the water does not reach the ground um, because it's blown away, whereas you have your non-spray irrigation or your drip irrigation is about 90% efficient. So it's all connected. I mean, you know, all pretty much all these sustainabilities in some way, shape, or form are connected to each other. You go from, you know, the equity and the environment and the economy and, uh, you know, food and biodiversity and water and energy. It's all interconnected. So, I, you know, these are the the you know course is broken down into sections but it's hard to completely separate out these different issues okay so it's all part of it uh, I'm not gonna go over this but this is linked to uh, the PowerPoint and you're welcome to take a look I think it's a really a good lesson in um, uh, food and equity and something called food deserts uh, which is a really important topic in the especially equity side of uh, food sustainability so I'll go ahead and let you do that if you'd like, but other than that, the uh, that's it for the presentation. Thank you.